Thank you for inviting me tonight to share my story with all of you. When Peter and Nikki asked me to present, I was thinking, okay, well, I thought this would be easy. I'll just get up and talk about myself and what my skills are. But really, this is more about you all who are here, Bridges Scholars. Who's in the Bridges program now? Okay, we have two. And, uh, oh, one more is out in the hall using the microwave. <laughs> so I really, for preparing for the presentation, tried to imagine my audience and what information about my path would be beneficial for you. So this is a lot about myself, but I'm hoping that you will also be able to see yourselves in my story and be able to relate to it in some way. I will have some words of advice about mistakes that I have made personally. And of course, my path is not your path. <laughs> First of all, this has already happened, I would imagine. When you were young and you had goals of what you wanted to do, those have likely changed and are different from what you thought they would be. I was born and raised in a rural area. My mother had three jobs. My father was a truck driver. Neither of them went to university. And neither of them graduated from high school. My mom was 14 and my dad was 15 when they had to stop drop out of school and work to raise money for their families. They are both intelligent people, but they didn't have the opportunity to go to college. And no one in my family actually attended college. No one had that goal, in fact. No one in my family aspired to get a higher education. This is me, as you see here. <laughs> My goal was to play football or soccer for the Liverpool Football Club. That was my top goal at that time when I was younger. Now, guess how many people were able to do that? How many people you think played for the Liverpool Football Club? Very few. It is one of the top teams in the world and very competitive. You have to be very, very skilled to be able to make that team. And look at me here. You can see I'm getting ready to kick the ball. But you can't exactly see what happened two seconds later from this still shot. The ball went to the right and my leg went to the left the opposite way. I make it look good, but that's not exactly what happened. It's an illusion. I didn't have the skills for that. I, I had to realize and accept that I would never achieve this dream of being a soccer player. It's good to have dreams, and no one told me that I couldn't do it. No one told me as well that I should have realistic goals for my future. This was my high school class when I was 11 years old, and you can see here, all boys. My mom was not a college person, and so every day I would come home. I would walk home by myself, and of course, I mentioned pre previously my mom worked three jobs, and so I was labeled a latchkey kid. At age eight, I had a key to my house. I would walk home by myself, let myself in, watch the news, do whatever I wanted until my mom got home. And then as soon as I finished dinner, I had to work on my homework, and my mother would sit with me while I did that. And that was an everyday event. 
Until I was 11, I took a test, a placement test, and passed that test in the top three percentile. And so I went to this school here. Only the top 3% of students who went into this school were, uh, their educations were paid for by the state. So my school was 13 miles away from home. I would go to school and then come home. It was a very, very good school. And again, it was a school for boys. This uh, school was founded in 1588. And this is the same time the Spanish ship Armada came to England. It's an old school, but provided an excellent education. And there were no girls for distractions. It was all boys. Now, one did get distracted during the school time. The, the veterinarian, he had the same background as I did. He went to high school, graduated college, and became a vet. Now, this young man here became a ship's doctor. Most of us had the support of family and uh, had the intelligence to want to achieve something greater in life. And here, this young man became a truck driver. And he is a good friend of mine still, and he's happy in his life. <laughs> and this young man became a McDonald's manager. Can you see me here? Can you pick out who I am in this picture? One clue, I'm the only boy with brown shoes. Oh, but it's cut off, so you can't see my shoes anyhow. <laughs> but hey, I still wear brown shoes. That's, that's the color I love. <laughs> this is me here. This boy right here became a research scientist. Really, I started out not wanting that at all. I just knew that I was going to be a professional soccer player. And after I lost that dream, I decided I wanted to be a submarine surgeon instead. I wanted to join the Royal Navy and work on submarines. I wanted to be a doctor on submarines, but guess what? Um, how many people think, do you think, actually achieve that job? Now, less than those who play for the Liverpool Football Club. You have to have really good grades. You have to go to medical school. In the UK, you go to medical school at age 18, and there are no undergrad or graduate degrees. It's a four-year program, and you can graduate at age 22 and then do your internship. You have to be very brilliant to get into medical school. You have to work hard. Now, I was very intelligent and have been, but I was also lazy. I didn't want to work hard. I didn't want to do the work required. I did the work necessary for passing and got sufficient grades, even A's. School was pretty easy for me. And then I had an A-level test, which was very difficult for me. And I realized that I was not ready I had been lazy up until that point and then realized, oh, shoot, I need to work a little bit harder. So I was not qualified to become a submarine surgeon. In my last year in school, I had an opportunity to study psychology. I thought, well, why not? That's interesting. The teacher's cute. Um, sure. Uh, you know, my two reasons for making that decision were not really the best decisions to follow to make that choice, but I became quickly fascinated and realized that I did not, well, 
I probably couldn't go to medical school and didn't really want to necessarily, so I thought I would focus on psychology. I applied to nine different colleges. All of them did give me an offer. If I had A's and B's, or if I had C's and D's, I could get into different programs depending. The university system in UK allows um, passing with A's to get into certain programs. My lowest offer was a C. So my lowest offer was, um, you know, accepted students with C's. So I took the test and then waited until results day. And everyone went to the university where the, the results were posted. You could see everyone's name and results. So I looked at the list and I found my name. So I'm trying to find, okay, I found my name and then I'm looking over and I have, oh, C, D, and D, but I passed three exams. But the offer I got was for C, C, two C's and I had two D's and a C. So I got on the phone and begged them to let me in to admit me to this university. They agreed to accept me, fortunately. It used to have a different name the Manchester Metropolitan University. It was the Manchester Polytech. And it really was not a real university per se in the old days. We would say, oh, my, my friends went to university, but that's not a university. Oh, you go to Poly. You don't go to a university. But that's where I went and I loved it. So it, it did become a university uh, later and they changed their name. It's a fairly new college established in 1970. At the time that I went, this was the largest institution in Europe. It, it was a very well-known um, university. There were a few researchers at that time, but many of the faculty didn't do research, and they only taught and weren't really involved in research at that time. They have a mid to low rank. And this is now, you can see, unranked for psychology research. They don't do research, mainly, but this college really taught me well. My teachers were outstanding. Here's one faculty here, Michelle Moore. My academic stories are mostly about females who influenced me, and she was the first female faculty who had quite an impression on me. At that time, I was interested in the brain and computers and how to build computers like the brain. That was one area I was very fascinated in. My final year at that university, my third and final year, I needed to take five elective courses. So my first several were very easy to pick. I picked those that were associated with my major, but my fifth course was a struggle for me. I had to pick something. I wasn't sure. So the other four courses were on Mondays and Fridays. And I thought, well, okay, let's see what's going on on Mondays and Fridays. So I looked at the classes on those two days. I lived far away from the university. And so um, I was, I was, thinking, okay, two days a week to college, be on campus, that's not too, too difficult. So I saw a course named 
the psychology of hearing impaired students. I really, at that time, knew nothing about deafness. I did not sign. I didn't know what hearing impaired meant. But it was a class that was offered on Fridays. And really, I was lucky. The person who originally taught that class went on sabbatical that semester. Manchester is an oral university. Has a strong oral tradition for deaf education. They taught deaf students using the oral method. And so the professor that w typically taught that class taught it that way. But instead, the semester I wanted to take it, Dr. Moore taught the class instead. So I was reading the um, curriculum, and the teacher actually she was at uh, disability studies uh, in the disability studies department and she didn't like the medical model and so she actually threw away the curriculum that was planned for the class and she decided to teach us instead about how deaf mothers interact with their deaf children or with their children and how they communicate so we were required as a class to go learn British Sign Language BSL so I had to go to class on Wednesdays anyway. I didn't get out of it completely. But it was an evening class. And the university did not offer a class in BSL. I think uh, most universities in the UK now offer BSL, but at that time there was only one university. Not this one, not Manchester. But uh, my classmates also took it. There were doctors and nurses in our class as well. <laughs> there were uh, motorcyclists who were in our class. And uh, two Hell's Angels, actually. They wanted to, how to learn how to communicate with deaf people as well. It was a, it was a very cool class. And, uh, you know, they now have a deaf bikers club. They'll uh, line up their motorcycles in a circle and turn on the lights so that the, the middle of the circle is lit, and they'll sign that way, and that's how they can communicate. Very smart way to do it. So I started learning BSL for a couple of months, and of course, you know, my uh, class at Well Poly at that time w was going along fine. And I really actually became very fascinated with my evening BSL class. I would stand up and present, and it felt like performing. I mean, of course, no, I was not fluent at that time. I was a bit awkward. Hi, hello, my n n name. I mean, it's just the same as people picking up ASL here. I mean, same way. It's a slow process. But I actually picked it up pretty quickly. And one day, my, my teacher was deaf themselves, and they came and asked if I would go to the deaf club with, with them. And so, oh, yeah, oh, if the two of us go, if you go with me, sure, sure, I'll go. So we went together. And I remember actually walking into the door of the deaf club in Manchester. There were about 200 deaf people there. I opened the door to walk in, and oh my, I began to panic. It was, it was noisy, both auditorily and visually. It was very noisy. It was confusing. I didn't know what to do. I mean, oh, and then I saw my teacher and uh, was quite relieved at that point. And we together went to a table and sat down and started introducing ourselves. And then I would, went, I would go and get a beer and come back. And I smoked at that time as well. So I was smoking and drinking my beer, trying to calm myself down. While tr oh, well, I can't really sign with things in my hand. So I actually had to learn how to sign with a beer in my hand and smoking at the same time. You can. It is possible possible just to let you know. So I began attending Deaf Club events every week. And it was cheap beer as well. I mean, Friday night, you go there first. You chat with your friends, you practice your signing, you drink your beer, and then I'm a little bit drunk, and then I could go join my friends at, you know, clubs out and about in the city. I was young at that time. But that was my very first exposure to sign language. 
I really never expected that to happen. I never planned to be involved with sign language and deaf people, but that's what happened and what I began to do on my Friday evening. I finished my dissertation on visual memory and deaf people. And I would go to the Deaf Club in the evenings. I would start to watch at those Deaf Club events uh, individuals. Now, suppose a subject is in front of a TV and different pictures are showing up on the screen and they have to remember and hold on to those images and then talk about them afterwards. I started fine. And um, I, I paid my subjects with beer. <laughs> So I started bringing deaf people in for these experiments and paid them with beer. <laughs> now, uh, the best time to test was not late in the evening because when you're a little bit tipsy or drunk, it's hard to pay attention to what's on the screen in front of you and it's hard to then reproduce what you're seeing. So that was not a good time. The data quality goes down quite a bit. No one at that time advised me about how to run a good experiment. I didn't really have peers who could mentor me. They just gave me the work to do, and I wanted to go to the Deaf Club. So how could I not combine that? I mean, um, I had to figure out myself how to do research. And the first research was not successful. But however... I finished my dissertation, and then my goal, well, I really didn't have a goal at that time. Uh, I was the first person in my family to go to college, remember? And so I didn't really know that I wanted to continue my education or stop at that point. Did I want to be a student? I may not, ha I, I wasn't really a good student, but I knew how to be a student. So that meant the next step for me was a master's degree. I'm not sure why. I knew that I was fascinated with brain and computers. I studied neural computation. So I got my MSS degree from the University of Sterling. It's also a fairly young university in Scotland. So as you can see, I'm moving up the ranks here with my universities of choice. This is from a recent rank. They had more of a research culture, and my MSS degree was for research, more specifically. So I was exposed to research more at this point, and my professors themselves were publishing and doing research. I, I didn't understand at that point how important publications were to your career. I just thought, oh, okay, I just have to pass the test, and then I'm good. This is a one-year degree, not two years. It's cheaper. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lot of work. I will tell you that I would show up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, of course, you know, I didn't enjoy going to work. I had distractions, and it was kind of depressing. But I would go at 3 o'clock in the morning and, and work as much as I could. So I graduated from there. You do not need an MS or an MSC to become a forklift driver, which is what I did at that time. I didn't know what my next step was going to be. I didn't know what I wanted to do next. So I worked as a forklift driver. You know, I could smoke and control and, and move. I mean, I'm not condoning smoking. But anyway, I could do that as I drove the forklift without beer. Without beer. So during my break time, I would read different articles and uh, advertisements for faculty position or academic positions. 
I did see two advertisements for job positions at the University of Kent. I applied, I mean, I, I applied for multiple jobs, but I did hear back from one job position and I was offered to go for an interview. The job title was technical representative, technical demonstrator. My job would be to go into classes and talk to students about their research projects within the psychology department. My job would be to show them how to do statistics like SPSS, for example, how to help them design their research project or their methods for their projects. I worked hard. I did get that job and worked for half a year and really enjoyed it. One day, I went to the bar with a, a faculty member. I asked the faculty why he picked me for the job. So my ego was deflated when he told me I was the only one who applied and that's why I was chosen. But anyhow, <clears throat> It was a good university, and I began my PhD part-time. My research at that time was object recognition in computer systems. So as I was going along, uh, some of my time I struggled quite a bit. I was supposed to work four days a week and then study also during the week, but other things were trying to take my time, and that made it impossible. So the one day a week, I was not focusing on my studies. I knew that I needed to focus full time. So I applied for fellowships at uh, Manchester, University of St. Andrews, the University of Leeds, and the University of Birmingham. All good schools. I did get interviews at all four universities, but did not receive an offer for any of them. Because I did not really know what a PhD meant. During the interview, they asked me questions, and it was clear that I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted. I was a risky bet for them. I was intelligent, yes, but I didn't know what I wanted to be involved with and what I wanted to focus my time on. But fortunately for me, one person offered me a position without an interview. Very exciting. Thank goodness. The University of Southampton. There was an American professor there at that time. They set up a new lab and offered me a job as an assistant, a PhD student in their lab. It would be paid. I got a scholarship for three years, and I was able to continue my research on the same topic as before. So I transferred to Southampton, and <laughs> getting even better on the rankings here, I keep on moving up. And number 22 for psychology research is not bad. But let me tell you, my advisor was pretty lousy. Nice guy, really smart guy, and we are still friends today. But for advising, I needed a lot of time and effort. I didn't know what I was going to do long term. I didn't know what I wanted my PhD in. Oh, I didn't even know what a PhD was, actually, at that time. But again, I was very fortunate. I met a woman at that time and had connections with her here and there. I decided that my topic I had planned to do for my PhD was boring and I wanted to pick something that was more fascinating because what I had was not quite interesting enough for me. 
So I met with my advisor one day and really just opened up and expressed everything I was feeling. Told him I was depressed and he just listened and said, okay, well, you're gonna, you need to change your topic. What fascinates you? And looking back now, really, I realized that I had continued my class. I was thinking on the, the previous few years and I had continued taking BSL classes. And I realized I was very interested in that. I told my advisor to which they replied, well, I can't advise you on that. I can continue to support you financially if you find someone else who can advise you in that area. And that person I found will be here in two weeks, actually, to interview for Associate Dean of Research position. Her name is Bency Wool. One day a week, I took the train up to London to meet with Bency. It was She was two hours away. She would give me two hours of her time every week. I didn't pay her. I tried to transfer to her university, but my university told me that I could not do that. I would have had to pay back the scholarship money if I had done so. At that time, I was very frustrated and very annoyed at that fact, but I, I can understand their position. So, Bency gave me her time for free. After she found out that I could not transfer, she continued to meet with me regularly. So I didn't finish my PhD. I then started working at the University of Southampton and Bency continued to support me during that time. I really was very fortunate and again I found a mentor in her as well. Or she found me. I, I don't really know which way that goes but regardless we found each other. And really without her I would not have a PhD. I didn't have the Bridges program at that time. There was nothing like this for me to be involved in. So the Bridges program is excellent. It's a wonderful support and great for Peter. <laughs> and of course I'm not deaf, but I am a first generation college student. I had, I mean, my mother supported me, yes, of course, but I didn't really have strong support in this area. she would ask me how many classes I teach and I would say one and they say oh and they're paying you for that oh wait don't see that Stephen sorry <laughs> but but m my mom doesn't understand my career and the academic side of things but she's still proud of me nonetheless and Bency Wool is my academic mother I was at, at Southampton for three years and was on scholarship the whole time. And then uh, my scholarships ran out, but my PhD was not completed. I should have finished it the next year. So I started working at the University of Bristol as assistant professor there. I worked there for two years and at the same time I worked to complete my PhD. I had good friends that helped me as I went along and as I got closer to needing to submit my dissertation, uh, my friend supported me and encouraged me to keep on going. So my two friends that I had allowed me to go out and smoke six times a day. That was all I got every day. That's it. They would give me coffee and food. I could not go out to the bar. They would close and lock me in to not let me go out to the bar. So I finished my PhD and I got the thumbs up and went on to work at the University of Bristol.
I worked at the Center for Deaf Studies. It was a great place to work. Voicing was not allowed. You could not use your voice. You could sign only or write back and forth. That was it. They did have a communica communication policy, and it said in there that using your voice was not allowed. We would have meetings three times a week, and if you would start... Oh, during coffee breaks, we would also not be allowed to use our voice. We would all get together and sign. I thought I could sign until the first time I went into a coffee break and all of them were sitting around chatting and having conversations and I, everything was going over my head. Are you using, I, I wasn't sure if they were using BSL and I realized that is BSL, but I could not understand it. I mean, this was a full immersion experience for me and I was there for two or three years. And by the time I left, I was very fluent in BSL. So I taught psychology and statistics. Voice off for all of those. So, of course, when I started, I was, I was a little bit awkward and not very smooth. But as I continued on there, my skills increased. Half of the students were deaf and half were interpreting students. So now I have my PhD and I have great sign skills as well. I decided I was ready to have a career. Uh, I thought I was ready, but research opportunities were not there. And I still did not know what it meant to be a professor. I love teaching and I always knew that I wanted to continue teaching. But I also realized that I loved research as well, and I had not yet published any articles. I was there at the University of Bristol for three years and still had not published anything. You need to find as many mentors as possible. It's very important. And you need to be persistent. This last one here, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but I started in the psychology department as an undergrad, and then I got my MSc degree in computer science, and then I went back to the psychology department, and then deaf studies department, and it was very beneficial for me. Now I realize it helped me tremendously. The variety of perspectives and ideas and ways of thinking about different problems and methodology, all of that I learned in these various disciplines. However, when you want a job long term and you want to become tenured, you will become tenured in a discipline. I think the next slide may uh, mention this a little bit more, but my first tenure track job uh, was not a good fit. I realized that I did not fit that specific discipline. I needed to force myself to fit into it and that's not something I wanted to do. I finished my studies at the University of Rochester. I moved here to the US in 2002. I did not ever expect to do that. I worked at the Center for Deaf Studies and enjoyed it so much. I was very upset when I had to leave. I didn't know what my next step was or what I wanted to do. But remember Bensi, I mentioned earlier, she knew how I felt through this whole process. And she forwarded an email to me. It was from a person at the University of Rochester looking for a postdoc fellow to work on a project that was about vision in deaf children. Now that is not the topic of my PhD. Sign language psycholinguistics was the topic of my PhD. I was teaching deaf students, that was my audience. I knew how to work with them if I put a slide up there or if an interpreter was brought in, I knew how to work with that. And I realized that 
deaf students, deaf people in general, have different visual skills, um, different skill at managing their, their visual attention. And the woman you see here is Daphne Bavelier. She flew me here to Rochester and introduced me to some very nice, interesting people, including Peter Hauser. I had a four-day interview at the U of R, and I really had no idea what the process was going to be. I met professors. Bensi told me that I would meet with a professor, and I needed to be sure and ask about their work. So each time I met with a different professor, I would say, oh, nice to meet you. Tell me about your work. That was my first question. And over the one hour it was done, they would tell me all about their work, and I would be attentive and not, and like I'm understanding, even if it went over my head, it didn't matter. And then I would go to the next appointment, and that process happened again and again and again. But it was successful. So I presented on my PhD research while I was at the U of R as part of the interview process, and they asked me questions as well. I didn't think that it was an interview, that presentation itself, so I wasn't really stressed. And then the fourth day, Daphne offered me the job at the U of R. Oh, so now what do I do? It's the United States, and I don't like the U.S. And I thought, oh, I asked if I could think about it, and they gave me two weeks to do so. So I flew back home to Britain, and I thought a lot about this. As the end of my two weeks deadline approached quickly, they called me. I answered the phone and thought, shoot, what do I do? Okay, I have to answer this pretty quickly. So they told me the salary level that I would be paid. If you give me $5,000 more, I will go is what I offered. I was just making up a number and, and thought that they might turn me down. But anyway, we got off the phone, and a few days later, they called me back and said that it was approved. Fine, we'll pay you 5000 more. Okay, so I made a promise. I mean, I didn't really have an ongoing relationship. I was okay with leaving my job. I thought... All right, I'll sell everything. I had two suitcases and got on the plane, headed to a new life and a new direction in the U.S. So I arrived in Rochester. I tried to explain to my family that it is not close to New York City. It's quite, quite far away from the bustling city. But I started my postdoc, and, and guess what? I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> you need to figure that out now. If you don't yet know what postdoc means, figure that out now. <clears throat> but again, I was fortunate. Daphne was very patient with me. She allowed me some time in a new country, making new friends, going out and meeting people. I worked hard at the time, yes, but we would go collect data in the evenings on, or on weekends. We would drive around collecting data, going into homes, testing children. And really, I was doing my job, but I wasn't developing my own line of research at the time. Daphne was very patient with me. She advised me slowly as we went along, helped me to apply for a grant. With the agreement of the editor, she would let me review papers with them. I slowly be began to build up my academic skills. I then applied for a grant, and I got one. Not on the first time I tried it. Not at all. Let me think here. I got three rejections, and that one doesn't count. So 
to foundational. So, so you were still publishing papers at that time as well, right? Now we are still publishing papers from that study, and that was in 2004 we began that research. Uh, and that was related to fMRI research. Now I have co-authored 13 papers with Daphne, uh, and these are peer-reviewed journal papers. She taught me well. I have developed my own perspective, my own philosophy, my own methods, my own approaches related to research. And now I publish patients papers with my students or by myself or with colleagues. I do not publish with Daphne anymore because I have developed my career as she has encouraged me along the way. She has been a fantastic, absolute, phenomenal mentor. <laughs> she helped me to understand what a PhD is and what a postdoc is. as well as what a tenure-track position is. So 2005 was my third year working with her, and you can see the publication progression here. Working with her helped my career skyrocket. And when I left Rochester, Guess who I listened to? I, I did not listen to Daphne. I was offered a job at the University of Illinois. Thanks to another woman, Jenny Singleton. Jenny approached me at a meeting at Gallaudet. It was a VL2 meeting. Jenny approached me and said, I'm, I'm on a search committee, and we are looking for people for a particular position at the University of Illinois. And we can't agree on anyone that has applied, so are you interested in applying? The, now, understand, she told me the deadline had passed a month ago. Or she was not the search committee chair, but worked closely with the chair. And so I emailed Jenny, who then emailed the chair, and they flew me to the University of Illinois for an interview. It is an old university. Not as old as my high school, but nonetheless. You see the number of students here. And it depends on which ranking you choose as to where they are on the ranking. From the University of Rochester, I got pretty high up on the list. And then the University of Illinois is comparable. And a lot of research happens at the University of Illinois. I set up my own lab there and did independent work. That environment is very supportive of research from their faculty. So Daphne told me I should not go. But I wanted to. I asked Daphne why I shouldn't go, and she said that I wouldn't fit well there. You can see here, Department of Speech and Hearing Science. My perspectives and my research so far had been about deaf children, how they adapt their visual attention, and how, how they fit their environment. I only knew deaf people who signed at that time. I don't really remember when I first met a deaf person who considered themselves hearing impaired. I mean, everyone that I had met who was deaf signed. Now, University of Illinois had an ASL program, and my job was to teach deaf culture and run the program. And I needed to do my research as well. So I had a lab that gave me equipment that I needed, everything I needed to run my research, which was excellent. And then I taught at the same time, which was easy. 
I had two classes every year, and that was it. I sometimes would meet with graduate students, but primarily I taught and ran the program. But there were a few problems. I had many disagreements with the dean. We did not have a good relationship. The dean wanted sign language classes to have a maximum of 24 students. But the dean thought that there should be 100. I thought it should be a max of 24 students, and the dean thought that we should have up to 100 students and that the students could support themselves, that they didn't need a more one-on-one -on -one style of teaching. They also wanted me to teach baby sign as part of our program. We went back and forth about that, and again, I mentioned our my relationship with the dean was not good. So a new head of the department came in, and I had disagreements with them as well. We butted heads often. Our philosophies were different. I had very good friends on the faculty in the department, and we collaborated and had good partnerships. But their philosophy was to agree with one specific teacher, and they focused on autism. Her perspective was on autism, which was fine. And, you know, there were many involved in that type of research, and that was fine. There are many uh, researchers who thought that sign language was bad for deaf children, particularly if they had a cochlear implant. They tried to prevent exposure to sign language on those students, but I had a very different perspective. When I was hired, I actually suspected there would be possible problems arise. I did share my concerns with the head of department. And I made it clear that I was a psychologist. And the head of department said, that's fine. You won't be considered for a tenure track position. And then that head of department left and a new person came in. And the new head of the department asked me why I didn't have any publications related to this or why I haven't been going to conferences. Now, understand, I was in a department that was not my preferred discipline. University of Illinois is a wonderful university, but if you go into the wrong department, it can be the wrong place for you. Yes, I could add to my slide NTID, but that might seem like it drops down on the ranking, and I don't feel that way. I feel like I am a very good fit here. I feel like I really bonded here and made a good connection. Now, I do have good memories from the University of Illinois and made good friends. And I have a graduate student there. I will go back next week um, on their defense committee. But I did realize that this was not the right place for me, and Daphne was right. She did tell me that it was a good university and a good opportunity, but maybe not the best opportunity for me. So when you're thinking about postdoc opportunities or t tenure track positions, people talk about the fit, F-I-T. If it's a right fit, what does that mean? You have to figure out what it means for you. It's very important part of your process. <laughs> Be true to yourself. Some people may disagree with this statement, you need a discipline. But I feel that the American tenure system is heavily dependent on you needing to know what discipline you would like to be in. Now this, don't forget to live. Illinois gave me family. I now have a wife and a family. I mean, you probably all want a family. 
you may not all want a family. Going for a tenure track position is not the best time or process necessarily. But as you can see my children here, very cute, and then my friends, some of my friends pictured here. This is my wife, and I don't know who that is. I'm just kidding. That's my friend's son, and he was very fascinated with me playing the didgeridoo. I tried to learn how to play that it, as one of my hobbies. I wouldn't suggest you try it. Oh, have you? You have tried it before. Yes, I failed at it as well. I played soccer. And guess how many of these people are faculty? There's a guess of two. There's a guess of all of them. There's a guess of one, me, being the only one. I, I am the only faculty. They're all people from the community. It's very important that you get outside of the university or institution that you work in. There are real people out in the world. <laughs> Through your establishing your career, you develop collaborations, and collaborations are very important for research, very important. I have found that good collaborations are with good friends. Now, it's hard to collaborate with people. It can be. It's good to have more than two people, if possible, different perspectives and different philosophies. Sometimes there can be disagreements. That can happen easily. You need to like them, and they like you, and have a good relationship for partnerships and collaborations to be successful. This person was involved with cochlear implant research with me. Wonderful person. This is David Moore. I'm not sure if you know him. I'm sure you do. He's in Cincinnati now. This was a training workshop. It was a good 10-day boot camp where I learned about EEGs. And through those types of events, workshops and trainings, you can meet potential future collaborators and develop relationships from that time. I got some money from the University of Illinois to fly over to Sweden. And I was involved in their research there. We emailed back and forth and still do. I applied for money uh, at the University of Illinois, and then the University of Sweden, they applied for money as well, and so we were funded to fly back and forth for our research project. One afternoon, we were sitting in their office in Stockholm, and we were working on our computers. We'd go back and forth, making edits as we went along. And at the end, we decided it looked pretty good. I got back home, and then we emailed a few more times and then submitted it. And we were funded the first time, that after we submitted the first time. Really, my point is that those who you share ideas with and publish with, if you like them and they like you, you can get along, and that helps your collaboration. The places you'll go and the things you'll see. Okay. So I have a collaborator in Switzerland. He's French. He's Swiss. He's Chinese. And I don't know what he is. <laughs> I forget now. So we were stuck in an elevator in Bern, Switzerland, a few weeks ago. So sometimes it's the best people to be stuck in an elevator with. They could be your collaborators. All right. Here's Sweden. Isn't Athens? Greece? 
One of the wonderful things about this job is that you get to travel. I know that the salary might not include that. You might be working long hours. But it's wonderful opportunities to travel the world. You get to meet a lot of fascinating people. In the past five years, I've been to Canada and the US, Sweden, Finland, Britain, Holland, Switzerland, France, southern France, Greece, and Australia. All paid for by other people, right? That is a real perk of this job. I mean, it comes with responsibilities as well. But if you're ready to go when you're young, you can go to conferences, and they can pay you to go to conferences. You know, you might have a good time when you're there. I didn't realize how important conferences were. Very important for networking. Very important to share your experiences with people. So I got to travel the world, which is good. Of course, you have to work, too. I traveled all over the world. And I finished here in the United States. And I became a US citizen. Network, network, network. It's really, really important. I'm not a confident person. I'm not a very social person. I mean, you're looking at me now thinking, look at how outgoing he is. But really inside, I'm not at all. So if I go to conferences I'm, I, and I'm there with a poster presentation, I have a difficult time approaching them. I feel like a high school boy again. But you have to get out there. See the world. Make good friends and collaborate with them. So that was my windy path, very windy path. But there are many different paths for you to achieve your goals. The straight path is sometimes easier. I mean, it's not a bad thing, not necessarily a bad thing. I really wish I had known these things ahead of time. What exactly does a PhD involve? And the importance of publishing your own work. Without that, you really wouldn't have a job. So you must publish. Networking is crucial. Those links that you make. If you might, you might meet an editor at, at one of those conferences or a reviewer of your paper. And if you have an opportunity to sit down with them and chat about your research, maybe they would approach you to your poster presentations. And that way you can have a better, start to have a better opinion, they might start to have a better opinion of you. So reviewers are human too, sort of. <laughs> Not always, but. that you will be hired and tenured within a particular discipline. That's one thing about the discipline and, the, and your fit within it. Don't necessarily have to agree with it, but I see other people as well have had this experience. 